Great. Really fun to be here. Can you guys hear me? Well, I guess. All right. In the back, can you hear me? This thing might not be on. Should I turn this on? Okay. <clears throat> Great. Well, I have a lot of happy memories in this room, I have to tell you. All day Saturday lab meetings, <laughs> PhD defenses. <laughs> Lots of happy memories in this room, so it's actually really fun to get to come back, and the new building is beautiful, so that's also fun. I'm still stealing the art from this lab all the time, too. Recently, I stole one of the phages that Ben Darby drew in the phage book to pair it up um, with this Banksy image, um, because, you know, here we are in this moment trying to grab the elusive phages to get them to do what we want them to do for a phage therapy. Um, we'll see how it goes in the next few years. So it's really fun to be here at the IPATH, which I know is really a world center for pulling that off. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about our Enterococcus phage projects. Um, my lab is based in Orange County, California, um, which might be the most famous for a television show that's called The Housewives of Orange County. <clears throat> It's not one of my favorite things about Orange County, but I take solace in the fact that there are a lot more phages than housewives in Orange County. <laughs> and this is our mural, we call it the phages of Orange County. Um, and like I mentioned, or like Dwayne mentioned, we have a microbiome initiative started up and we have a symposium on September 20th. It's free and we actually have some really luminary phage people coming. We have um, Magna Barbu coming and we have Martha Cloakey coming all the way from the UK. So I really um, hope you guys are able to make it. It's been really uh, quick to launch. So many people from around our campus at UCI have been interested in doing microbiome work. So it's been really fun the last few years getting to talk about every kind of sample you could possibly imagine, not just poop, although poop is important for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so everybody's used to seeing this uh, background about how the human microbiome is very diverse, although all of you out there eating ice cream might not be promoting that at the moment. Um, uh, but anyhow, you know, if I, if I had a half a mil of blood from any of you, I could probably detect about a half a million molecules, and each of you are quite unique. And, you know, this is a phage-focused talk, and so I'd like to to point out that a lot of that uniqueness comes from the constant coevolution between our phages and our bacteria. So each of us have our own little separate bioreactor where these evolutions are taking place over the course of the decades of our lives. And that's a big part of how we get to have such a distinct microbiome, one person to the next. So it's really not just horizontal gene transfer, which is what a lot of people think about when they think about plasmids and phages. Um, spreading diversity in a microbial community. It's also about these co-evolutionary arms races uh, where it, the interactions between the phages and the hosts lead to increasing diversity through time. Um, so phages have a lot of important consequences. Uh, you know, they're part of the circle of life as bacterial death releases nutrients and increases the turnover in a system. They allow for gene transfer, they drive evolution. Um, and they have a lot of applications, as you guys are getting into here. Um, and they're also a great system for studying evolution. I know many of you were here for the meeting in 2015, which I really like this image, um, which allows us to invoke the term dark matter when we're talking about phages, because so many of the sequences from the phages are still unknown, even here in 2019. Um, I know another talk from a different Whiteson in this room last year was really focused on dark matter. But you'll notice that when uh, this other Whiteson gets interviewed, he still remembers to bring up guts when we're talking about dark matter. We definitely have every right to, to point to that. Um, and so here's some examples where when you look at sequence data, um, you still find that the phages in the community, for the most part, don't have many hits to databases. So in gut data, something like 70% of the reads still don't hit to any databases. And this is an example from cystic fibrosis sputum, where 80% of the reads are not hitting to any databases. Um, okay, so a lot of the diversity is coming from viruses. Um, there's a lot more variation in the phages. Most of them have no homology to known sequences. And this is an oldie but goodie that I just have to share, where if you look uh, at the phage uh, 
genes, the different types of metabolism that are encoded, you see all this interesting differences and diversity coming in each community, whereas the bacteria are much more uniform. So as Forrest says, phage are cool, bacteria are boring. <laughs> However, the phage still need the bacteria, so let's not forget about them. Um, so one, one strategy, the coevolution strategy for studying the phages is a really exciting opportunity for us to learn how the, um, the phage and the bacteria are interacting with one another. And it's only been studied in a small number of model systems. So um, E. coli and Pseudomonas and a few other model systems have been well characterized using coevolution. Um, but it's a really great way to get a sense of what's going on in a community. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we've been learning about it using Enterococcus. So, you know, our goal is to get a little closer to figuring out how the phage and the bacteria are evolving and, and what they're doing. So I've been um, learning a lot from my colleague at UC Irvine, Jennifer Martini, who's been doing coevolution studies in Synecococcus and ocean bacteria. Um, and her students are so jealous of how fast Enterococcus grows. They have to wait two weeks for the, for the doubling times to happen, and we can do these experiments really quickly. Um, and most of the work I'm going to tell you about today um, was actually carried out by a student who recently finished in my lab, Stephen. And I think he actually gave a talk in this room somewhat recently. <laughs> That's true. So you guys have to ask lots of questions and keep the discussion interesting. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Enterococcus and its phages and tell you some of the projects that we've been doing with it. So Enterococcus is a normal member of the human gut microbiome. Each of us have probably about 1% of our community comprised of Enterococcus. It has a really ancient association with animal guts. In fact, back to the split between sponges and nematodes. So um, a lot of different creatures have Enterococcus in their guts. It's a somewhat oxygen and, and um, redox stress tolerant bug. Um, and so as a result, it actually tends to bloom when we take antibiotics or have other circumstances that um, derail the anaerobic environment in our guts. So um, Enterococcus is now actually a really important pathogen. It's one of the escape pathogens. It's often um, antibiotic resistant. So about 30% of Enterococcus infections are resistant to vancomycin. And, um, and in general, when people take antibiotics, it becomes abundant. Um, so it's an opportunistic pathogen. Um, and when, as I was mentioning, when you take antibiotics, it can overgrow. We saw this ourselves. Part of the reason we got into studying Enterococcus in the first place was one of the first projects I did when I started at UCI was possible because some of the ID doctors over at the Children's Hospital in Orange County handed me a bunch of boxes of baby poop from preterm babies. So we called it a freezer project, which was perfect because we could just hit the ground running. And what we found in these babies was that Enterococcus was very abundant, um, as were other things you wouldn't hope to be abundant in the infant gut. So Enterococcus is here in the, in the blue. Um, and so, as a result, this, was, this is really a motivation for having phages that you could use to manipulate the enterococcus in the gut. Uh, so we, as you all know, antibiotics are one of the biggest hammers we have for manipulating microbes, but it's a really blunt tool. So if we had access to something more focused, like laser focused, like phages that in intentionally can infect a particular strain, it would give us a lot more power to manipulate the community in the direction that we want. And they're, they're really understudied. So um, Enterococcus phages are underrepresented. If you look at the sequenced phages in NCBI right now, you'll find that mycobacterium are through the roof, of course, because of the phage hunters program. Um, but there are very few sequenced enterococcus phages, even now. Um, I think we were able to double that very quickly just in a year of looking or so. Um, so yeah, so not very many enterococcus phages. So we formed an elite team of phage hunters and uh, immediately proceeded to the Orange County Water District. And uh, we've been getting sewage from them once a week uh, throughout the year. And we formed this team led by PhD student Stephen Wandro, and he had undergrads and master's students helping. And so we would get the sewage. We have enterococcus strains. In fact, many of the enterococcus strains that we have came from David Pride here in San Diego, who's in the room. 
And we would do plaque assays to isolate the phages. And, uh, and now I'm going to tell you about what we learned from them. So we, we got, I think we have probably about 20 phages that we've characterized well now. Here's 16 of them. A lot of them turned out to be myoviruses. Um, and we call them the wusses. If you look at their plaques, you'll see why. Then we also got quite a, a few cyphoviruses. And they definitely make more robust plaques. And there was one potovirus that we were working with a lot. And it also makes really robust plaques. So we call these guys the murderers. Um, but I'm going to focus a lot on these uh, Brock RNA myoviruses, um, which have turned out to be interesting for a number of reasons. Um, so here's what they look like, kind of classic looking myovirus. They actually have enormous uh, genomes, though. And um, so far, we, we've only seen them behaving in a lytic way. We've never seen them acting as lysogens. They have a really broad host range, which is one of the things that we're really interested in. And they encode about 200 genes. They have a wide range globally. We found them thanks to um, Rob Edwards' Search the SRA tool. We found them in lots of samples from around the world. Um, and here you can even see how the sequence homology lines up in the samples from around the world. So, um, so here's one of the, the first phage that we got actually from a bank in Canada. Thank you, Canada. And. Uh, <laughs> And so the alignment here is all relative to that first phage. Um, but as you'll see, amazingly, when you get a, you know, a metagenome from China that contains some of these phages, they have really high homology across the genome. Some of them have regions of higher diversity um, coming from other places. And we even found them in some of the phage cocktails that have been sequenced, which I'll show you later. Um, OK, so here's our Brock RNA. It has about 400 genes in its pan genome. And if we zoom in on the phylogeny, um, you find they kind of cluster into two groups. Um, Stephen Wandro named the first group Wander viruses. And considering their broad host range, it's a good name, I think. And then the other ones um, are known as Kokika. Maybe Rob Edwards can help me learn how to pronounce that. How do you pronounce that? No idea. Because you, you had that in a paper. We learned about it from your paper. <laughs> OK, well, <laughs> so there were two clusters um, showing up in these Brock viruses. And there's a core genome of about 66 genes that both clusters have. And then you'll see that each of the different um, subclades have their own core genome, also with about 60 genes. And then there's a bunch of genes that are just more dispersed throughout them. If you look along the genome, we find that the early genes are the ones that are the most variable, and the structural genes tend to be more conserved across both clades. Um, and then the tRNAs are also more variable. Um, late genes conserved between genera, as you see. Um, and then their, their host ranges are actually really broad, even across both fecalis and fecium. So this was one of the characteristics that we thought could be really important for making them useful. Um, and, uh, and we found that this first clade has a narrower host range. As you can see, it's mostly focused on fecalis, whereas some of these wander viruses are really broadly infecting both fecalis and fecium. And these strains that I'm pointing to, many of them are clinical isolates from here in San Diego. Um, we also found that the number of tRNAs was greater in the phages that have a broader host range. And then just to compare with the other phages I was telling you about, there's the cyphoviruses and the potovirus. They didn't tend to have as consistently broad of a host range across the strains, but they were way more potent in terms of their plaque forming ability. OK, so I'm going to tell you about the coevolution between the enterococcus and the phages. And so the idea is that you know, as the bacteria and phage undergo these constant battles where they select for particular characteristics on both sides, there's a lot of diversity um, being generated from this process. So our experimental design um, for the coevolution uh, experiments was, you know, first of all, just to grow the phages and the bacteria together. 
Um, we did this over the course of 16 cycles, so we did it twice. We did the passaging twice a day, so this only took, you know, a little more than a week. Um, so in this context, we're studying the coevolution of the bacteria and the phage together. We had two important controls. Um, and, and in each case, we extract and shotgun sequence all the DNA. So we're not picking out isolates, we're sequencing the whole population. And we learn things by doing it that way, which I thought were really interesting. Um, there's, of course, also advantages to working with isolates. Um, we also had a host control, so where we didn't add the phage at all, so then we just get to see how the bacteria evolves in those lab conditions. And then we also had a phage control, where we filter out the phage every night <coughs> Sorry, we filter out the host every night so that we give the phage a chance to evolve against a naive host each, each passage. So then we're looking at the evolution of the phage, not the evolution of the bacteria. They're not having a chance to interact in the same way. Um, so this won't shock you, I'm sure, but the bacteria are growing just fine on their own. Um, so here I'm showing you the generations versus the growth. Um, and in the context of the phage control, where the bacteria don't have a chance to evolve defenses, you'll see that they get obliterated. Uh, but then what was really interesting is that in the co-evolution condition, you see these interesting arms races um, arising. And each replicate has a slightly different dynamic, but you see the phages and the hosts having a chance to duke it out um, in the context of the co-evolution. So we wanted to ask, how the phage is evolving its infectivity. Um, and then, of course, we also, by looking at the sequence data, we can see on the other side how the enterococcus is evolving resistance to the phage as well. So I was telling you that these phages have 200 genes. And so we did a careful sequence analysis, we meaning Stephen Wandro. And, um, and it, it was interesting to me in the one sense just how few genes actually had consistent mutations arising across the replicates. So I'm going to tell you about those. Um, one of them was in the capsid. So it you know, makes sense that that would be an important point for the interaction. Um, another interesting mutation that arose was in the tail fiber, which I'm going to tell you more about. And there was also one hypothetical gene where consistent mutations were arising across the replicates of the coevolution and not in the host or phage controls. So everything I'm telling you about is really um, something that tells you about the coevolution because we've done both of those controls. <clears throat> so here's the genome that I was telling you about. This is the phage from Canada. It's one of these myoviruses. And uh, I'm, I just want to point out this tail fiber gene. And um, something really interesting happened here. When we first got the data back, it was really puzzling. So we mapped all the reads from the final time point against the phage genome. And we saw this crazy spike with several thousand fold extra coverage in this region of about 1.8 kilobases. Um, and it, it took us a while to figure out what was going on. We used a lot of different approaches, PCR and so forth, to try to see if there were duplications happening so that perhaps it's just an artifact of, you know, the lack of the assembly of duplications that are stacking up on top of that genome. Um, and it turns out that that's exactly what was going on. So, um, in the end, we used a minion sequencer to get nice long reads that could go through the duplicates because they were so long. Um, and they confirmed what we had already seen from PCR, which was that there's this 1.8 KB region inside the tail fiber gene, which is you know, even bigger, more than 6 KB. Um, and we saw duplicates arising, sometimes as many as four or five duplicates of this enormous region. And, um, and it was unique to each replicate how many of the duplicates were most common in that replicate. Uh, it's a phenomenon that we could reproduce um, in, the, in cultures, but it wasn't a very stable phenomenon. So, you know, if we tried to grow up really large amounts of these, for example, they were delicate. Um, so, I'm, you know, one we would love to do is really nice um, electron microscopy to be able to look at the tail fiber and see, are these duplications making it longer? or are they changing the properties of the tail fiber in a way that we can understand? And I think those are still good questions. Do you have a question, Anka? Yeah. Um, so this is a myofate. How T4 like is it? And it, does it look like it's replicating via a rec recombination at the end? I mean, how, how T4 like is it? I mean, its genome doesn't share much with T4. It doesn't look, I mean, it's got the, the cosmetic 
appearance shared. <laughs> Um, that is a good question. I think it does have a DNA polymerase, but I don't know. That's a good question. And do you normally replicate it, oh, sorry, do you normally grow it in a wild type and there are caucus, right? So it's all recombination possible. I mean, it, it can grow in a lot of different enterococcus. I don't know whether you'd want to call them wild type because there's lots of different clinical strains there. But um, but we haven't tried to like remove the polymerase from enterococcus and then see if the phage can still. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how whether you can stabilize those duplications, right? So that you can have more consistent growth of the uh, the subpopulations that have different copy numbers of your. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you see any repeats at the flanks of the single copy duplication? No. No, no, and actually, um, yeah, that was helpful because it made it easy to do PCRs and stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we, we did put some energy into trying to purify this en enough of it. So we were, Stephen was growing like liters and liters of these guys to purify enough that we could um, try to do cryo EM, but the tail fibers are delicate and so they break. So it wasn't uh, easy to get a nice image of them. It was possible to get enough DNA to put them on the min ion though, so that was really fun. But when you do a lysate and do PCR with primers on the outside, Principle, you should always see a population of N and plus one. Yes. Yeah, yes. we see that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you can look at the PCRs. You'd probably have different eyes for them than I do. That would be fun. But yes, that's what we saw. Um, okay. So now moving to the to the host side, um, we also using this same data from the metagenome populations from the coevolution, we could ask about what happened to the host. Um, and one of the things that happened, and you know, we actually have done this now with quite a few of our ephesiums and ephecaluses with the myoviruses, and in general we've been finding that in ephecalus, the most common mutations that are consistently stacking up are in an um, exopolysaccharide uh, biosynthesis locus. And in ephesium, it's a similar process that's being affected, but the mutations are accumulating in this YQW locus, which is also important for the production of the exopolysaccharides. So um, just to illustrate this, um, here's the gene. This is the, the YQW locus gene that I was telling you about. This is the one that's the most common in ephesium. Um, and one thing that was really interesting watching how these mutations stack up is that, you know, we could look inside of each individual replicate and see which mutations were becoming the most common. And we found that while it wasn't always the same mutation that was occurring in each replicate, they were very near each other in the same gene. So they likely are telling us about a similar functional consequence. Um, <laughs> even though they're not exactly the same mutation. So I, it's really fun to do this with replicates and then to watch these phenomena arise, um, you know, with slightly different signatures, but pointing to the same, uh, the same consequence. So what's also interesting about this is that these capsule exopolysaccharide genes, if you look in the human microbiome, they have incredible diversity. So there are lots of examples of this, not just in enterococcus. Um, that these genes have just incredible variability um, in the human microbiome. So that's very likely to be the result of antagonistic coevolution that's going on with all of the phages. <clears throat> Another really interesting um, set of mutations that arose were in the RNA polymerase. Um, so the phage is depending on a host RNA polymerase. And um, I'm going to show you where these mutations stack up. Um, so if you look in the um, beta prime subunit, these red dots are showing you the mutations. And it was the same type of phenomenon where they weren't always the same mutation in each replicate, but um, they were near each other. And so it suggests that the same functions were being affected 
um, in the RNA polymerase mutations. Um, so anyhow, so that, that, this to me is a really quick way to get some insight into how the phage and the bacteria are interacting with each other. So for example, you know, if you wanted to hand me a biobank of phages, you know, knowing the genomes would be nice, but we wouldn't be able to annotate most of the genes. If you had um, information about how the phage and the host are co-evolving with one another, this only took 10 days. And at the end of it, we knew a lot more about the interaction between the phage and the host. We can, see, we can tell you, you know, which mutations are across replicates accumulating only in the co-evolution branch. And as a result, we can tell you something about what the selection pressures are in that particular interaction. Um, okay, and then I also want to tell you about our Enterococcus phage cocktails. Um, which I know will be of interest here. Uh, there were a couple of undergrads in our lab who were working really hard on this last year, Clark and Cyril. Some of you may have even met Clark. He brought all of our enterococcus phages here to San Diego. And um, okay, so I mean actually this is, this is exactly what I was just saying a minute ago. You know, we'd like to use coevolution to characterize the phage bacterial interactions with the hope that we'll find different ones that allow us to use orthogonal strategies to attack a host with phages that enter with different mechanisms. Um, so the goal is that we could, you know, do a bunch of coevolution experiments, pick phages that have orthogonal entry mechanisms, and then design cocktails where it's just too hard for the host to evolve resistance to all of those different mechanisms at once. Um, and, I mean, this is the center of it, so I don't need to tell you guys about this, but um, as bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics, um, there have been some cases where using phages as an alternative to the antibiotics, or perhaps in combination with the antibiotics, could be really effective. Um, so one strategy that we used a lot in the last year, which has been really fun, is um, we grow the phages and the hosts together in 96 well plates and we do growth assays and then we just watch to see how long it takes for the host to pop back and you know evolve resistance against the phage. So it has a few nice consequences. We can see how quickly the resistance is arising and also we generate resistant mutants which we can then sequence and study. So here's an example of um, an enterococcus growing on its own. So this is what the growth would look like without a phage getting in the way. And then here's what it looks like when resistance is arising um, when you add the phage. So here's, it, it didn't take too long for the host to come up with a strategy to evolve resistance to this phage. So, Katrina, sorry, mm -hmm. back up a little bit. Right? So, in these kinds of experiments, how often, so I assume that what you do is at 20 hours you take the lysate, right, and then reinfect and see a complete resistance. That's how you know that your bacterial host has become resistant. Sorry, not the lights, the the, the supernatant. The, the survivors. The yeah. Survivors. So how often is this a genetic change versus um, a physiological change that doesn't give you that pattern of complete resistance when you reinfect? Um, let me think. I don't know if I have a number for that, but um, do we. You, we, we, we plate these out and then we've been doing a lot of sequencing and we've really often been finding the same kind of mutations I was just telling you about from sequencing the metagenomic populations. So, um, so in many cases we are able to see a mutation arise that's you know, in the DNA from that colony that is consistent with what we found that I already showed you. Um, so I don't know how often it's something physiological, I hear you. Like if they're just kind of becoming dormant and camping out. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just wondering about how, um, how often do you simply get a phenotypic change, but not a genetic change? That mm -hmm. a yeah, well it does sometimes happen that when we try to regrow things, there's like, you know, it seems like a contaminant, and it could be that it's not a contaminant, it's just somebody that was one of the members of the population that could lurk and then bloom when you gave it nutrients again. That would be an interesting thing to try to quantify. We didn't really try to do that. And the MOI for this is? The MOI is a really difficult and good question. And, um, and 
well, I mean, the truth is when we titer our phages one day and then we titer them again the next day, it's changing. So our titers drop. So these phages are very hard to get into a, into a high titer. Um, I would say like 10 to the 7th is lucky with, with these myoviruses. That's not true for the potoviruses and the cyphoviruses. Those were much easier to get into high titers. So the MOI was in a way a moving target in these experiments because we weren't always able to add the same titer day to day, if that makes sense. So we're using a volume of phage from a particular titer and then you know we keep track of it and then we try to make fresh batches with, which have a higher titer again. But I would say that's not consistent in the way it probably should be in all of these experiments right now. I, yeah, that wouldn't be helpful to talk about actually. Um, yeah, that's hard in these particular phages. Um, okay, so you know the idea is that maybe we can uh, make cocktails of phages that will have um, orthogonal mechanisms to the antibiotics um, and allow us to treat infections. And in fact, we found um, some of the phages that I've been telling you about in um, some of the Russian cocktail data, which is really interesting. Um, and so, you know, in some of these cases, they use multiple phages in a cocktail already, um, either in a targeted way where they know what the pathogen that is being targeted in other cases where you just try a cocktail and hope that something works. Um, so if it turns out that, you know, there's cross resistance where arising, the mutations that arise and can resist one phage are then also resistant to another phage, this of course would hinder our ability to build phage cocktails. So that was something we were really interested in testing with this little collection of phages that we developed. Um, so, you know, we wanted to know if they become resistant to one phage, does that mean that they are then um, no longer susceptible to other phages? Um, so we wanted to ask the question if the phage cocktails are preventing the evolution of phage-resistant enterococcus. Um, so here I'm showing you um, the resistance in the same assay that I described earlier, how the resistance is arising to one phage. Here you can see it's arising pretty early relative to this cocktail, which contained two phages, so the resistance was delayed. And then here, when we added three phages, you'll see the um, resistance is persisting throughout the assay. Um, so now that you've gotten used to looking at this kind of data, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how we're going to portray it so that you can look at a lot of these at once. Um, so here I'm just showing you the end time point. So you see um, what happened at 72 hours, which is how long these growth curves went on for. So here are um, the results from these assays with one phage. And these are the myoviruses, the cyphoviruses, and the potoviruses. Here they are with two phages, and um, we intentionally group them as, you know, com two phages coming from the same family versus two phages coming from different families. And actually, we were designing these experiments just after Duane had given an IPATH um, talk, and in the question session at the end, people were asking you a lot of questions about using sister phages and whether you should um, you know, add the same amount so that you ended up with double the, uh, the number of phages that you were add, adding or whether you should divide that in half. And so we debated it a lot and we decided to do our best to keep the number of phages constant. So in this case, we would add 10 microliters of one phage. In this case, we would add five microliters of each phage, just to be clear about how that was set up. Um, and so you can see there are cases where the phages from the different families are a lot more successful at suppressing um, the host than individual phages were able to. And then we have cases with three phages over here as well, uh, sorry, three different families of phages, so the cyphos, the potos, and the myos. Um, and I'm going to show you in detail in a minute. In some cases, it's not clear that the third phage was adding a lot more. In some cases, the, the, the outcomes which you see over here were also possible with just two of the phages, so the, it's not clear how much the third phage was adding. Um, but it is really interesting just to watch these dynamics as you build the cocktails, and it does seem like we're seeing some um, 
some different outcomes when we have phages that have different uh, evolutionary backgrounds. Um, in what sense? Like if adding more phage, you actually get competition between phage. I mean, we didn't go beyond the, what I'm showing you right here with three, and um, I don't think there's a case like that. But I have to say, I don't think there was ever a case where I was convinced that three was really better than two, because if you look at all of our co our combinations of three, usually two of them had a, a similar outcome over here. So I, I'm not putting all the data up here because you wouldn't be able to read it on a slide. But if anybody's interested in sitting and puzzling with me, it's, it's from what I can see, two did the same job as three with this particular collection of phages. Um, so do phage cocktails prevent um, the, the evolution of the phage resistance? Um, yes. but. It really does depend on how the cocktail is designed. And another thing we haven't played with is the order of addition, which could also be really important. Um, and so that, that would be something that would be worth paying attention to. And of course, synergy with antibiotics could also be really important. And then um, to show you how the cross resistance is looking, um, we have been doing um, experiments where we take one of these mutants that arose from the, and actually this does get at the order of addition in a way, we take one of the mutants that arose in response to one of the phages, and then we go and see how they are able to grow um, with the other, with a totally different type of phage. So here, um, same type of assay that I've been telling you about, and then we take the um, end point, we grow up a colony and we sequence it, so we can learn what the mutation was which in a way gets to your question, Anka, if there's a genetic basis for this. Um, and really, we very, very often saw these mutations in exopolysaccharide synthesis genes, the ones I was already telling you about. Um, there were a few other kinds of mutations that sometimes popped up too. Um, and then on average, we were seeing about 60% cross resistance, and I'll show you what I mean. Um, so here I'm showing you, um, these are the different classes of the phages that I've just been talking about. So we would take um, a particular enterococcus, this was E. fecalis, DP stands for David Pride, and one reason we chose this one is because it was susceptible to a lot of our phages. Um, so DP11 became a real workhorse in the lab last year. And so we would evolve resistance against a particular phage. So UMP was our potovirus, one of the murderers. And then we would ask how the mutant, which is resistant to UMP, uh, is whether or not it's susceptible to all these other phages. And so you can see that um, mutants that are resistant to UMP are also now resistant um, to myoviruses. Although actually, the, in this case, the wild type was already resistant, so in some ways, they've regained susceptibility um, to some of the other myoviruses, not necessarily all of them. Um, here's another example. YI6 was a, a fecalis that was susceptible to a lot of the phages in our collection as well. And so you can see that um, as they become um, resistant to one phage, they also are resistant to some of the others. Um, so that was interesting to us to see that the cross resistance worked even across families. Um, so it wasn't something that was necessarily really specific um, inside one family. And a big part of that is that each of these phages led to um, mutations in those exopolysaccharide synthesis genes. So, um, so that could be, because it's a common mechanism, it does make sense that the resistances are um, happening across the families. So is cross resistance to phages common in enterococcus? Um, yes, and it can occur among the different phage families. We were also interested in seeing how the, um, the arisal of this resistance affects antibiotic susceptibility. And I'm sure you guys are fans of this story that um, has this phage that's come out of Paul Turner's lab, 
where a pseudomonas phage is able to revert drug-resistant pseudomonas back to becoming sensitive to the antibiotic. So it's really powerful that not only is the phage an alternative to antibiotics, but it also can help the strain become sensitive to antibiotics again. So of course we would love to see if that's possible with the enterococcus. And in fact, um, you, many of you may have seen this paper from the Dwerkop lab where they've shown that vancomycin resistant enterococcus can become more sensitive to vancomycin after exposure to some phages that in their paper, I think some of the phages that they are working with are similar to at least the cyphoviruses in our lab. And I don't know why they ended up with different phages than us. You know, we all go get sewage and isolate things. Why did we get so many myoviruses? I'm not sure. Um, but anyhow, in their case, they saw this um, uh, resistance uh, to the antibiotics uh, subside after exposure to the phage. So we were interested to see if that was going to happen in our case. Um, and actually, a little bit more about what they found. Um, they also found that this was mediated through the exopolysaccharide synthesis. Um, and like I said, that it increased the vancomycin sensitivity. And they even did some experiments in mice where they found that these mutants were not as able to colonize the mouse gut after being exposed to the phage. Um, so in our case, uh, you know, we also weren't starting with hardcore vancomycin resistant strains, by the way, and I was quite reluctant to have those in the lab, to be honest. So we were starting with vancomycin sensitive strains for the most part, although many of them were clinical isolates. Um, and we found that many of the phage resistant mutants um, did not have a huge impact on vancomycin sensitivity. Um, here you can see this is the vancomycin concentration and here's bacterial growth. And um, these are EPA mutants that arose and these are, we just lumped together the, the mutants that arose that did not have a mutation in the EPA synthesis locus. And you'll see that, um, well in general we saw that some of the EPA mutants were actually if anything, uh, more resistant to vancomycin. So in a way, I'm looking at it like the phage exposure is modulating the antibiotic sensitivity. And so maybe if you start out very, very resistant to vancomycin and you have a big, thick exopolysaccharide on your capsule, maybe you can reduce that through the exposure to phage. But maybe the, maybe the opposite can also happen that you start, when you start out quite sensitive, exposure to the phage can lead to a bigger, thicker capsule that then makes it harder for the vancomycin to be effective. You sort of mentioned it, but you didn't. Um, so do you actually know the receptor for these phages? Well, it, it sort of spells as if it's the, the exopolysaccharide, but do you know which part, which aspect of the, which part of the structure? I mean, we know what we learned from the coevolution. Right, so uh, uh, to me that's pretty close to knowing what the receptor is. So it, uh, the thing that's mutating in defense must be important for the, for the entry. So, but the thing that's mutating are these tyrosine kinases that are important for the production of the exopolysaccharides. So in my mind that meant that the exopolysaccharides were an important part of the entry mechanism. But no, I, I guess I don't have like a structural mechanism exactly of how the phage is, is attaching. Um, yeah, and so we have, like I said, we have not worked with a lot of vancomycin resistant strains, but the ones that we had that had a little bit of resistance did not become more sensitive after exposure to the phage. Um, okay, so in conclusion, we um, think that the continued phage isol isolation and characterization is really important and it's also really fun, so we're definitely going to keep our Orange County phage team going. Um, we are excited to use coevolution to define the molecular interactions. <clears throat> I mean, to get towards what they are using coevolution, um, because it's a really quick way to get a glimpse at what those interactions are. A lot more information than you would have from a static genome. Um, and then just that the phage cocktail design matters. And so in some cases, we were able to see that certain combinations with different phage families made a difference. Um, cross resistance is common in enterococcus um, and it could lead to altered antibiotic susceptibility. 
Um, so with that, I would like to thank my lab. Um, this is Halloween. I remember we were giving a presentation to convince the people at the Orange County Water District to let us collect their sewage, and we showed this picture, and they were like, you people in academia are always having so much fun. <laughs> but this is not every day. <laughs> it was Halloween. One student even dressed up as the building, Maga, that we, we have our lab in. Um, and we are looking for a postdoc to work on this project, actually. Um, here's Stephen and Clark bringing the phages down to San Diego one day last fall. Um, so we're going to be working with David Pride um, on this project going forward. So um, yeah, we'd love to hear from people who are interested. And I'd also love to take questions. So. Yes, Anna. Yeah, we, we sequenced four different time points. So you, you mean like how, what happened to the mutations at each t through time during the experiment? Um, because like for example, this uh, tail fiber duplication that I was telling you about, we already saw that starting to happen after four days. And in some of the replicates, it was the most abundant after eight days. So it clearly was a dynamic that was um, you know, pulsing up and down in the population through the course of the experiment. It was long enough to see those dynamics in the 16 cycles. So, is that your question? Yeah. yeah. So, so your cocktail was three original phages that you're putting together, but you, in your course experience, you see this repeated evolution of the repeats. Is that, is that the long tail fibers? The, Have you tried something? Yeah. The, the, the tail fiber duplication happened in a much simpler experiment, which was just one host and one phage. We didn't see that with cocktails. Okay. Because if you have a repeated evolutionary event where you always get the exopolis actor, is that right? Exo mm -hmm. uh, could you use the, long, the evolved phage in your cocktail as if you're predicting it goes that direction? Would that make, because you know, if that's continually happening, maybe you could have long tail fiber phage in there with your cocktail I mean, that question also just should remind all of us that every time you isolate a phage from the environment, it's at some point in an evolution in evolutionary history because it's clearly been replicating inside of another host for different amounts of time. Um, so yes, it could be that taking phages that have already been passaged through a particular host will give them properties that help you. Um, depending on the host that you want to battle. I, I see that point. These particular tail fiber duplications, I, I would be surprised if they arose in nature with like a diverse set of hosts around. I think that was something that was able to arise in this artificial nutrient rich, one phage, one host type of a situation. It doesn't mean we still couldn't learn from it, but I think that it was something delicate that would be uncommon in a more harsh environment. some of Scott's point. So what I take from your data is that most of the phages, whatever family they're from, at the moment are, are using the exopolysaccharide as the receptor, right? That's the EC hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So if you start with a mutant uh, enterococcus that doesn't produce the, the capsule, right? And then go through the phage isolation protocol again, you're going to see those phages that essentially um, infect what in Salmonella and E. coli we would call rough strains. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if you use phages that um, have a different receptor that's not the exopolysaccharide and pair them in cocktails with ones that do, the phages that are going to see exopolysaccharide are going to put pressure on the host to get rid of the exopolysaccharide, now exposing the second receptor for phages that have something, some other receptor, mm -hmm. right? And though that combination seems like it would be particularly useful for the kind of therapy that you're talking about. That is a very, very good idea because we need to somehow get away from all these exopolysaccharide um, targeting phages. So if we could enrich for phages that have an alternative entry mechanism, that is a very, yeah, that's a very good idea. Yeah, or maybe we can 
even start with more extreme mutants that just don't have the exopolysaccharide or are really reduced. That's a very cool idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Any other bacteria? No, any other so, feature on the phage, in addition to the family, that make you select those that you try to make them as different as possible. Yes, I, besides family, what else were you considering? Really, we were just, to be honest, those cocktails were designed with just the family in mind. We did know what the host range was. So before we designed those cocktails, we did big host range assays with something like 60 or 80 enterococcus, like half fecium and half fecalis. So, but it turned out that their family really was associated with their host range. So like you could see those two subclades of the Brockvirian A. One of them could infect fecalis and fecium almost equally well whereas the other was really mostly infecting fecalis. So those are properties that I think are probably very important for designing the cocktail, but they did track with the, the family. And another thing that's been really interesting in the last few months is that David Pride, in their lab, they've repeated many of these host range assays, and of course, they don't get exactly the same results. I mean, nobody will be surprised to hear that, but um, we've been debating how to, how to handle that. Like if you get, if one lab gets a yes, does that just mean like, yes, that host is sensitive because in some circumstance it's possible for the phage to infect? Um, I, that might be a reasonable way to handle it. And that's a question that's important in this effort you guys have to build up phage biobanks because titer and lots of other conditions will affect um, the host range. But yeah, your question is what properties we used. I mean, I think the host range is really the property that we cared about, but it also tracks with the family and the genus that they came from. Yeah, it's like the Swiss Army knife hypothesis or something like that, that you have different parts coming out. I, I don't think that's what's happening here. Um, there is not diversity in those repeats, actually. Um, they're really surprisingly consistent, 1.8 kb, they're enormous. So compared to everything else I've seen like that, like there are examples of these Swiss Army knife types of deals where um, in different mutants you have a particular tool emerging or a particular sequence and there's diversity in that region. We are not seeing that. It's really just replicates of the same thing, very, very same size, even though it's enormous, 1.8 kb. The other examples I've seen are like a fraction of that size. Um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, I, have, I don't know other examples of something like that arising. Um, you know, my hypothesis, which you know, is not written in our paper because it's, I don't have a lot of evidence to support it, but it could be that the tail fiber is getting longer because of those duplicates and the exopolysaccharide is getting thicker. And so it's, or anyway, the properties are changing in a way that it's an advantage to the phage to have a longer, different structured tail fiber. I mean, it's 1.8 kb is not like a tiny little diversity generating element like we've seen in other phages. It's really different scale. Um, so I don't know, but I, I don't know what you mean about the diversity from from Steven. I think Steven showed you guys a bunch of the other mutants that we've been sequencing, um, which sometimes have some interesting features arising. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we've taken up enough of your time. <laughs> I have questions, but I can save them for, for later. Sounds uh, good. Please uh, thank Katrina for her talk. Thank you.